So tonight for the 11th year of the Elephant Mountain Literary Festival, we have four incredible authors who are each going to read for us. We're going to have our first two authors, and then we're going to have a break where if you haven't had a chance to get some of the snacks over here, I already have, and they are all delicious, and I highly recommend them. And I'm sure you could pair them with a lovely drink at the bar. And uh, so we'll have 15 minutes to uh, do that, and then we'll come back for our final two authors. So, first up. Okay, so their bios all read really incredibly, so I'm just going to read them straight out because uh, they have such a long list of accomplishments, pardon me. So, Angie Abdu. Angie is the author of seven books, including short prose, novels, and creative nonfiction. Her first novel, The Bone Cage, was a finalist on CBC's Canada Reads. Angie's first memoir, Home Ice, Reflections of a Reluctant Hockey Mom, I need to read this, hit the Canadian bestseller list and the number one spot on Amazon Canada's best-selling hockey books. Angie is an associate professor at, of creative writing at Athabasca University, and her newest book is The Wild One. Angie, I give the mic to you. Thank you. I'm very tall, so I'm not sure this will. There we go. That was a beautiful poem. And I have to tell you, when it comes to writing, I give up about once a day, so I think <laughs> you're doing OK. Yeah. Um, so I'm very excited to be in Nelson. It's so beautiful here. And I have to tell you, I had a dream a little while ago. I dreamed that I moved to Nelson. And when I woke up, I just thought, of course I should move to Nelson. And it wasn't because it's beautiful, which it is, but it was because I thought, I have so many creative, brilliant, strong women friends in Nelson. And I look out at the audience and I can see them all. I see Darren and Becky and um, Jane and Amy and Verna and Almeida was here today. And there's just so many writer women who are fascinating, interesting, wonderful people. So maybe I'll move to Nelson. I should, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then to be a part of this panel today, Shana Lambert was in the first ever writing workshop I ever took. We both went to UBC for this summer workshop called Booming Ground and we both met there. Neither of us had published a book. So we go back to both when we were just hoping we could be writers. Tom Wayman I've looked up to for a very long time, and then he was on my supervisory committee for my PhD, which was my second novel, so he's a real mentor to me. And then when I finished This One Wild Life, when it came out published, I'll talk about this later, but every single person who read it said, have you read Finding the Mother Tree? You have to read Finding the Mother Tree. So I bragged, not only did I read it, but I get to be on a panel with her. <laughs> so, so I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to read, though, I, this afternoon I talked a little bit about my... Um, mystery novel because we were talking about ideas of time and what you can do in a novel and in this book because it's a ghost story we're kind of in the present and the past at the same time so I wanted to read a little bit to show how that works so Eli is a little boy who's um, sort of possessed or haunted by his great-great-grandfather he has to make up for his great-great-grandfather's mistakes and marries the girl next door but also a woman from his great-great-grandfather's past as Mary and I walk up the mountain and away from Sam's yard the woods become like a house. Thick trunks stand tall around us in every direction like walls, and the dense leaves overhead make a roof. I can't see the sky, but golden streams of sun push past the leaves in a maze of laser beams. Mary stays ahead of me, her strong legs mounting the steep slope without effort. She looks so pretty here in the deep green shade of the woods, striding through the golden beams of light, so much prettier than she did last night in the bathtub. That wasn't Mary, I tell myself again, just a dream. I believe it now here in the woods with the real Mary. Those images, Sam would tell me, were only fears, what might have beens. My skinny legs don't have the strength for mountain climbing. My thighs burn. I try to ignore the dull ache in my calves. I lean forward and put a hand on my knee with each step to relieve the pressure on my already tired muscles. I am one step short of crawling up the steep slope, and I pray for the land to flatten out, but it gets steeper until we might as well be climbing a wall. Sweat rolls down my face and neck, soaking my shirt and stinging my eyes. My lungs feel full of something hard and inflexible. I can't get past that, thing to get a, that hard thing to get a full breath. Mary bounds up the mountain ahead of me. Wait up, I want to say. Please wait up but the rat-a-tat-tat of my heart thumps in my ears and I have no breath to make the words. 
I've never been this far above the house before. Dad would be proud of me for doing such a hard climb. That's my boy, he'd say. My mom would want only for me to come home. I cannot think of my mom now. The farther we get, the quieter the forest grows, but it's not a, res not a restful quiet, not for me. Why should a living thing be so silent? I know you're here, I want to say to the forest, to the leaves, to the animals, even to all the little bugs. I know you're here. Speak up. I stop long enough to catch my breath, and then I yell, slow down, Mary. Wait for me. I use my loudest voice. I want it to be a demand, not a plea. Oh, Elijah, come on. You can't keep up anymore? Mary taunts me, walking backward on the trail, a few steps out of my reach. She stretches her hand as if she'd hold mine if I could only catch her. I never could keep up, Mary. Sickly boy, sickly boy, sickly boy. Faces run through my mind, chanting the words. Mrs. Evanhart, Nicholas, the boys who put the sand in my mouth, even the girls at my old school who pretended to like me out of pity. But the way Mary looks at me, I'm neither sick nor a boy, and her look makes it so. It's the minor lung that holds you back, she says, or black lung, that's what you called it. What? You've all got it, she says. Got what, I ask, but my breath is so short, the words die inches from my face. Nothing, Mary says, just nothing. I'm going to skip a little ahead to this little hike. Come on, slow poke, Mary says into the strong wind. We're almost there. She tugs on my arm, and we push through some dense underbrush. Twigs scratch my arms and neck and face. I know I will be a mess of wounds if I ever get home to my mom. I'm about to complain. Enough, Mary. I want to go home. But then we come out on a flat bench of the mountain, a green clearing filled with wild daisies. I recognize this place. In the center of that familiar field stands a copse of trees. It looks planted, too precise, too orderly to be natural. The trees make an almost perfect ring. Nature doesn't do that. In the middle of the circle of trees, I see a grand stone. I recognize it right away as a tombstone. A grave comes as no surprise in this neighborhood. This pretty clearing makes a nice spot to remember a special person. A family has put some thought into this grave, even if it is hard to get to. Mary watches me, waiting, and I know there's more for me to discover. I'm cold, and I've eaten nothing today except half a bowl of oatmeal and some wild berries. I haven't seen Mary eat at all. I want to go home where my mom will warm and feed me, even if she scolds me first. I would take the scolding. The dark clouds move quickly across the sky now and send shadows scattering across Mary's face. In this light, I see a new sharpness in her cheekbones and a hollowness under her eyes. Suddenly, she wears the face of a woman, not a child. She looks hungry. The yellow fabric of her dress pulls tightly across her breasts. My mom says never to call them boobies, adult names for adult body parts. It hurts to look at Mary. I round the stone and read, Mary, 1902 to 1920, much loved. I'm cut loose, falling, 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 and there is no ground. I reach for the tombstone to steady myself against it, but then I don't want to touch it. I know this stone. Mary sits down in the long grass and pulls daisies from the ground, tucks one behind each year, each year. She picks another and leaves the long stem attached. I watch her use it to tie her hair back. I try to study, steady my vision on her, on my friend, Mary, but she blurs and spins. There are two of her and then there are six. I close my eyes tightly. I am Eli Mountain. My mom is Lucy, a medievalist. My dad is Nicholas, an environmental scientist who works at a coal mine. I am Eli Mountain. I am 10 years old. One, zero, a number to hold on to with each hand. I do want to stay. Mary picks up a small pebble and lobs it at the tombstone. Her throw is not fierce. The pebble bounces off the stone and lands lightly in the grass. Even on my gravestone, she said, they always called me that. They always called me Mary. Even there, he could not acknowledge that Mary was not my name. She runs her hands the length of her legs, but not as if she's cold. It's about power, she says. They name you, they know you. More than that, they name you, they own you. Rain begins to fall. I shiver, but Mary has no goosebumps on her bare arms. You couldn't stop either, Eli. You always called me Mary until the very end. What do you want, I hear her say, though her lips don't move. What do you want, Eli, the same or different? And that goes on. There was, I went, um, because there are some Tanaha characters in this book, I went through this consultation process, and I went, the last step was presenting at an uh, elders meeting with the woman, the cultural liaison I'd been working on with. And her grandfather, I told her how there's this boy in the old, he, he like somehow has this communication with his great-great-grandfather. 
and um, he said, oh, there's that, we call that being able to talk to the old people. And he had not read my book. He said, we call that being able to talk to the old people. He goes, there was this woman here who was really good at it. And there was this place she would go. And you went up a really steep mountain. And then you got, went over and it cleared out to this bank. And there was a circle. And there was this, and he described what I had described in my book. And I looked at his granddaughter, who was my culture liaison. And she's like, do you have goosebumps? And I said, I have goosebumps. And we said, that's in my book. That's the spot they go. And he said, well, you have my permission. <laughs> so that was that. <laughs> Um, I want to read a little, I have a short part, I have this weird thing happen to me, so this is a memoir, this is about my own life, and this weird thing happened to me with a tree, and I never talk about it because it makes me sound crazy, but whenever, this is the reason people want me to read your book, so I'm going to read this thing here, so I was having a very bad time, I was getting kind of bullied online uh, for an extended period of time, and I thought my reputation was ruined and my career was over, and I would just in the morning stare out this window at this huge green space and try to just remind myself how small I am compared to the mountains and the forest and how if I'm that small, my problems must be even smaller. Every morning upon waking, I would have a moment when I'd forgotten how my life had changed. But as I came to full consciousness, my new reality greeted me with a punch to the gut. Instead of getting out of bed, I'd close my eyes, trying to lose myself to sleep, unable to do it all again. I didn't want to start another day to learn who else had unfollowed, unfriended, and discredited me. But one morning before I made that transition from ignorant bliss to knowing despair, an old growth cottonwood out my bedroom window captured my attention. It stood high above the rest and beamed energy, energy, its positivity flooding in like sunlight. Its branches reached out to me. While I remained in a semi-dream state, the massive tree embraced me with unconditional love. A warm, a warm calm flooded through my body and raptured, I gave myself over to the experience of the tree. The warmth and calm gradually morphed into a full-bodied euphoric high. I let, the tree, I let the tree love me. The experience, true and real, lifted me. In my mind, I floated above the mattress, my gaze locked on the tree. I had never felt so light, so enveloped in kindness. I didn't tell anyone about this encounter, not right away, but I held a small bit of that kindness and love in my chest as I proceeded with my day. When the new but already familiar anxiety clawed at me, I raced to a window, my eyes fit found my cottonwood, I opened myself to its energy, I breathed. In the following mornings, I learned to turn to the tree as I woke, ensuring it was the first thing I saw. The sensation of the tree got me through the winter, and I started to note, note patterns. I'm not going to have any wine, I told my husband one night in spring as the forest behind our house burst into vibrant green life. I have this thing going on with the cottonwood the big one outside the bedroom window. It's really kind to me, but I can't feel its kindness when I'm hungover. It works better if I stay sober. The, the tree? <laughs> the room fell into intense silence. Both Ollie and Katie, my kids, turned to listen. I probably shouldn't have said anything. Yeah, it's, well, you're atheist, so you might understand, not understand, but I had kind of a religious experience, mystical, with, um, with the tree, he said. Yep. Okay, Marty turned to the kids, his eyebrows high. The tree doesn't like it when mom drinks, kids. <laughs> the tree became a joke around our house. My dad's an atheist, Ollie told his friend, Harley. I am too, but not my mom. My mom believes in the tree. <laughs> really, Oliver, I said, refusing to be embarrassed. An 11-year-old atheist? You don't think that's a bit arrogant to believe you have all the mysteries of the universe figured out in sixth grade? Yeah, Ollie, Marty interjected. You need to be almost 50 before the universe lets you in on the mystery of the tree. Even I'm not old enough for that. Only mom is that wise. Katie giggled, covering her mouth with her hand. It couldn't be a cedar or a spruce, Marty asked. Your god has to come as a cottonwood, the weed of the forest. Okay, haha, -ha, laugh if you want. I know what I know. But I spoke as if making fun of myself. Laughing was easiest. I sensed no mean spirit in their ribbing. The tree became a quick and easy joke for us all at a time that we needed laughter. Mom's having wine, Katie would chirp in her cheekiest voice. Don't tell the tree. Maybe the tree will suddenly fall over on her when she takes her first sip, Ollie laughed, and then we'll all know the truth. I learned to keep quiet about my tree most of the time until Timothy, a novelist from Vancouver, visited. Novelists like weird ideas. They crave strange experiences, anything to challenge their beliefs, stretch their way of thinking, provide material. The weirder, the better. Timo had focused his full attention on, my winning, on winning my dog Blue's affection, refusing to be deterred by my dog's aloof personality. He really is a stunning animal, Timo said. As long as Timo agreed with me about Blue's overwhelming beauty, I did not mind the diverted focus. Cheese is the trick, I told him. Passing over a big block of cheddar and a knife, Blue will do anything for cheese. 
Distracted, Timo talked to me while making small offerings to Blue, first setting a piece of cheese on the floor at arm's length, tempting Blue to come close, eventually holding a piece in his fingers, reaching towards Blue without making eye contact. Come on, sweet Blue, he muttered under his breath, hoping to lure him far close enough for a pat. We'll be friends before I leave. Blue, eyes on the cheese, took tentative step toward Timo's fingers, but then backed away, circling around to hide behind the kitchen island before coming into sniffing range again. You're feeling better though, hey? Recovered? I knew Timo meant the question for me, but he didn't make eye contact, too focused on his project. Like Blue, I responded well to the averted, averted gaze. Yeah, I had this thing with a tree, an experience. It helped. I gestured over my shoulder towards the cottonwood out back, but Timo wasn't looking. A tree? It was the same question Marty asked, but without the trace of mockery. In Timo's tone, I heard only curiosity. He stretched out his hand. Cheese, Blue, all for you. He stared away from Blue towards the front door, ensuring that he posed no threat. Not sure at all that Timo was listening to me, I told him about the tree, its unconditional love, the overwhelming sense of security, the sudden confidence that I would be okay, that a force beyond my understanding was taking care of me. It made me wonder about the medieval mystics, I said. They were persecuted, pushed to despair, and then they had these almost erotic experiences of divine intervention. Maybe that's how our bodies protect us. When we feel attacked and driven to despair, the body floods us with some saving hormone, a natural antidepressant, a much needed high. You, Timo said, are working very hard to explain away an experience. Timo possessed a confidence I never will. He didn't hesitate to speak with certainty about the essentially unknowable. He didn't need to couch discussions of the divine and jokes and self-deprecation. I was raised in the church, he said, as Blue tentatively took the piece of cheese from between his fingers. You don't need to explain anything about your tree away to me. Thank you. So next up, we have Tom Wayman. And over his career, Tom has published 30 books of poetry, nonfiction, and fiction, including Watching a Man Break a Dog's Back, Poems for a Dark Time, published by Harbour in 2020, other recent titles include a selection of his essays, if you're, not a f if you're Not Free at Work, Where Are You Free? Literature and Social Change, and a collection of short fiction, The Shadows We Mistake for Love. Tom was named a Vancouver Literary Landmark in 2015. I want to know how you become a landmark. And in 2022, he was given BC's George Woodcock Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Literary Arts. He has taught widely across North America, including at Nelson's David Thompson University Center, Kootenai School of the Arts, and of course, wouldn't you know it, this landmark is a co-founder of the Elephant Mountain Literary Festival. Tom, come on up. menu here, in case you get hungry. <clears throat> well, as you know, um, I, I write poems as well as, as fiction and nonfiction, and um, most people hate poetry. Um, by the time they get through um, 12 years of education and been tortured with poems, um, they'll tell you, um, right to your face, how much they hate poetry. When, when it comes to music, they might like some music and not like other music, but they'd never say, I hate music. But they will say, uh, I hate poetry. Um, Billy Collins, the American poet, has a wonderful poem about uh, some English teachers have tied a poem to a chair, and they're busy torturing it to reveal its hidden meanings. <laughs> what, what all this means is that from time to time, poets have to write some propaganda about how poems really are good. This is called... Poets are the janitors of the human heart. Poets are the janitors of the human heart, which, after even a little use, has dirt and mud trapped in. Spiders build stringy webs in some corners, and bits of food, sorry, bits of paper, food remnants, odd pieces of clothing are discarded along with additional litter. As well, Structural and other essential parts wear out surprisingly early. Poets during their shift not only try to clean up the mess, they identify needed repairs and missing components. 
the hours poets spend behind their pens or keyboards can also put a polish on the restored locale so that it shines. Naturally, some poets are not very skilled. As usual with humans, the worst ones at what they do have the most to say about their imaginary accomplishments. In fact, almost anybody can get their building service worker certificate if they agree to sit through a bunch of classes and read a few manuals. Some maintenance companies will even hire the uncertified, thereby providing, according to the bosses, work for people who are developmentally delayed or with mental issues, thus justifying the low wages paid. Shelley, in a defense of poetry, calls poets, quote, the unacknowledged legislators of the world, unquote. But a trust fund kid like him was unlikely to notice janitors, let alone consider himself as one. In that perspective, he resembled another trustafarian before the fact, L. Cohen, who claims cracks are where the light gets in, whereas any competent janitor and carpenter knows cracks are where the water enters <laughs> and rot begins. Ah, but what marvels the best of these sweep and moppers, tidiers, and buffet to a gleamers achieve? A construction transformed by only words so that those who engage with it each day view it through reinvigorated eyes. Certain lines, stanzas, images can cause a dented, garbage-strewn, or completely trash place to be refurbished. Even stains caused by long usage or hard treatment can be abraded to again acquire a sheen. Like most challenging but repetitious work necessary to keep a society or a life functional, the poet's tasks are largely judged beneath consideration, ignorable. Yet shift after shift, their labor restores a vibrancy to what has been soiled, degraded, damaged, enabling the owner of the heart to turn off the alarm system, push back the retractable shutters, then open the doors to the outside one more time. Well, as I say, that's just propaganda, so you don't have to pay any attention. Um, getting the, um, the George Woodcock Lifetime Achievement Award is, is kind of scary, because you think, well, that's it. That's, that was a light. Um, but it, one thing it did was to make me think about, it's just like reading an obituary. You look at kind of the arc of a life and, and think about um, what was accomplished and what wasn't. And I realized for me, um, uh, there were two pivotal experiences in my life. And, and the first was in 1966, um, I went to S Southern California. Um, I, had, I, I had been working, I'd, I was going to UBC and I was work I'd worked three summers as a um, newspaper reporter on the Vancouver Sun. Sun would hire us for four months a summer. And we were expected to just go on and work the rest of our lives on the Vancouver Sun. But I had won some money and uh, of like a scholarship. So I went to the University of California at Irvine to study writing. Irvine is, is south of Los Angeles, about, about 40 miles. I saw that excursion as, as a break before working for the Vancouver Sun for the rest of my life. Um, but it was the 60s in Southern California. So uh, life had other plans. Poem is called The Party. It's dedicated to uh, two friends, two pals from those days, Stuart Peter Freund, 1945 to 2017, and my very good friend, Dennis Sela, 1942, 2020. The Party. Another party at the rambling rental house on the cliff edge above Shaw Cove Beach in Laguna that October evening, half the people present up dancing to the doors light my fire, seven minutes, more than twice the length of a standard hit single of those days, organ and drum and Jim Morrison's insistent vocals fueling us 
as we sway side to side and shift our weight foot to foot, sweating as if going someplace. Several party guests cluster on the back porch to pass a joint, still seriously illegal in California. Beyond them, the night Pacific strikes the beach below with its own thundering percussion, repeated and repeated. And the sea also flows west past rocks on which sea lions croak and bellow and further to where the rim of the world turns into stars. Two couples have taken the curving path from the bottom of the porch stairs down through ice plant and bougainvillea to the sand, mostly dark, although checkered by dim patches of light cast from the windows of other houses along Cliff Drive or from the windows of the party and from the door to the porch opening and closing. One couple has slipped off their shoes, walking the edge of the resounding surf. The other leans together in blackness to kiss, hands passing down each other's bodies. And in the room where so many of us are pressed close, jouncing up and down to hear what there is no time for, wallowing in the mire, other people perch on old couches and chairs, talking together in twos or threes and drinking, or gather to talk and drink and reach for snacks by a table crowded with full, half full, and empty wine bottles, beer bottles, and bowls that contain or contained potato chips or corn chips alongside depleted dishes of red and green sauces for dipping, and an empty one that held guacamole, gobs of which have dripped across the tablecloth amid chip shards and small puddles of the other salsas, beer, wine. Cigarette smoke spirals up from the talker's fingers and ashtrays balanced on armrests or on the floor and pours out a lips to saturate the air with a slowly swirling fog that hovers above everything. At the fireplace, which is never used, its mantle jammed with half-empty glasses and bottles temporarily left on it, by people who have risen to dance, Dennis and some others stand talking to the poet Robert Bly, the ostensible guest of honor, here because he has given a reading that afternoon at Irvine, where many of those in this living room, kitchen, porch, or down at the beach in the darkness outside are students. Later in the conversation with Dennis, Robert will abruptly hoist one foot and kick him in the stomach. Apparently, for no reason, a moment Dennis will remember all his life. And at last, the police are at the front door, summoned by a neighbor because of the noise, two large cops asking Peter, who had signed the rental agreement, to end the party. Our peace can't be disturbed, one of the officers states, but when we receive a complaint, we act on it. The police on the front stoop wear as their shoulder patch an artist palette, since the town likes to think of itself as an art colony. And indeed, Pacific Coast Highway, two blocks inland, which serves as the main north-south street, is lined with commercial galleries featuring paintings of the surf by moonlight, like this night, but without anybody on the sand and with a bigger moon. And now Dennis, as at every party once the police arrive at the door, moves through the dancers, the drinkers, the talkers, to confront the uniforms and guns, to object, he says, to their attempt to stop people harmlessly enjoying themselves, and to argue it isn't even 1 a.m. Then Stewart, as usual, pushes his way to the discussion happening at the door, and in his drunken manner, tries to justify to the cops Dennis' attitude, believing he can explain things better to authority, which of course annoys Dennis, and soon those two are disputing with each other, tonight exasperating Peter, whose sole aim is to get the officers to leave before they are provoked enough to demand to enter, to check ID or something, and maybe smell a pot, and somebody ends up arrested, with word getting back to the landlord, and having the lease or whatever Peter had signed canceled, and all staying here evicted. The Stones, or Janus, are on the stereo now as the police stand firm, like time, like death. You have to shut it down. 
As the dancing inside continues, the dancers forgetting for a moment a low mark on a quiz or their draft status or a paper due Monday or how to end the war in Asia or some of their poems rejected by a magazine or the situation in Watts or of Chavez's farm workers or that they wish they had asked Aaron rather than Joan to dance. That dancing, that music, the party, even after the cops leave with their warning, don't make us come back, continues. The dancing has lasted for years, decades, across a new century, through the fear of nuclear obliteration, the great fires, fierce rain, Main Beach and Forest Avenue flooded, war after war, love after love, that dancing goes on, the dancing, the party, the night, the dancing. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, the second sort of pivotal experience of my life when I look back was the um, BC's uh, public sector general strike in, in 1983. And it was an eye opener for me because many, many of my ideas about the possibilities for social change um, came alive. Um, for those of you who, who don't know the story, it, um, the provincial government had, had passed a, a whole series of, of draconian laws that affected um, most aspects of the, of the social sphere and um, a coalition of unions called Operation, uh, Operation Solidarity got together with a coalition of community groups called the Solidarity Coalition and um, for several weeks um, a, a whole other way of thinking about what a self-governing society can look like seemed tangible. These are coalitions of the impure and the incorrect, but it seemed the only way um, in my life that um, that change, um, real change, could could happen. Um, and in all the years since, um, those those few weeks and and the promise that seemed to hover just just beyond our fingers um, has both consoled me and inspired me. Um, I'm going to read a poem out of what um, one of the mechanisms that that happened, um, it's not set during um, Operation Solidarity, but about 10 years before, I'd been working at uh, Canadian Kenworth. Um, we built trucks in Burnaby. Um, I worked on the hood line. Um, this is before the, the deindustrialization of Canada. Um, this is in the, in the 70s when in Vancouver, Kenworth made trucks, uh, Pacific made trucks, Hayes made trucks. They invented the off, off road logging truck, and White Western Star. There were four different truck manufacturers here in BC, and now, of course, there's none. Um, the poem is called The Old Power. The old power is still here, pulling into work one morning to find the access road to the company parking lot jammed with men and vehicles, more cars piling up behind, spilling out onto the main street and down adjacent lanes, everybody arriving from different directions to stand together at the gate of the almost empty lot, just a few foreman's cars and the night shift of painters, where five men from the company's sales and service division on strike for more than a month now stand with their picket signs. Early morning dark and a cold rain, five men with sheets of cardboard looped around their necks changing feet to keep warm, drinking coffee from the small white cups somebody brought them, five men in a line, occasionally talking to somebody else, but mostly just standing at the very edge of company property, and then a little space, and then all 400 of us mixed in with our lunch pails and boots and the cars that brought us here. Like an old myth that suddenly works, a marvelous event in a forest, that happens to you personally, so that again, you can believe in what you once had clung to and then abandon. Five sheepish men in the rain at the end of a road hold back our hundreds. And this is something both of us make, they carrying the symbol out in front of us and we agreeing. So whatever happens here is ours. After half an hour in the drizzle, 
the sky getting lighter, not a supervisor or foreman in sight. Some of us wander off to the Lowheat Hotel for coffee. Then I drive home. And all the while, the five men stand there like pillars of the old power, an idea made flesh, an idea that works. So that today, Thursday, no one has to build a single truck. And we can take all the rest of this day in the rain for ourselves. Thank you. Well, given, given the transient nature of, um, of those, those pivotal things that, pivotal events in my life, and, and indeed given the transient nature of my own life, it, it raises that question about why make art? Why, why bother to write anything? Um, or make any kind of art. So I'm going to close with a poem that tries to answer that question. And uh, in the poem, I'm going to mention three um, uh, obsolete occupations and that are now surnames. And I, I'm not referring here to people with those names. I'm referring to the occupations. And the three are F Fletcher, Cooper, and Wainwright. A Fletcher was someone who made arrows. A Cooper was someone who made wooden barrels. And a Wainwright was someone who made wagons. The poem is called Shelby Wall and John Lent Perform 12 Bar Blues at the Upstairs, Vernon, BC. February snowfall outside the big front windows this evening, the dense array of flakes suspended as the rhythm of the struck strings of Shelby's guitar, insistence of the troubled soul John's lyrics inhabit, propel the streets and roofs steadily upwards through white tufts, like a car in a night highway amid a snowstorm that, in the headlamps, rushes at the windshield. Except, as the driving wheel of the verses cycles again, the words, the chords, draw the jammed room, each building, the town, higher out of the gravity well. Note by note, we rise through hours into sparser and sparser air. The sun will fail. Galaxies will fail. The fabric of this universe will spread and dim or collapse to an infinite weight. And yet, we sang. Flint sparked fire. We hammered steel into steel, found the recipe for bread, plowed the same field for 40 years. Fletcher, Cooper, Wainwright, typewriter repairer. It was messy. It mattered. It didn't matter. We lift into nothing, trailing behind us the lost chants, incantations, war cries, denunciations, love charms, languages, harmonies. It was messy. It mattered. It didn't matter. These are what we made as we ascended amid the snow, as our dwellings traveled up toward the greater night. We couldn't do nothing. Here, where memory simplifies, weakens, and is gone, we couldn't stop. We ascended outward to the dark. It didn't matter. We sang. Thank you. All right. Well, we have two more authors, amazing authors for you this evening. Uh, so first up, we have Shana Lambert, and she is the author of four works of fiction, Petra, Oh My Darling, Radiance and The Falling Woman. Her work has been nominated for the Writers' Trust Fiction Prize, the Ethel Wilson Award, the Evergreen Award, and the Frank O'Connor Award for the short story. Shana has taught fiction and memoir extensively, including with the Writers' Studio at Simon Fraser University, the Humber School, Humber School for Writers, and the Machosan International Summer School of the Arts. Her recent novel, Petra, which she will read from tonight, won the 2021 Ethel Wilson Award for Best Work of Fiction in BC and the Yukon, and was a CBC Best Book of the Year. Shana, the mic is yours. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, especially to the, um, it's, it's hard to believe it's soon going to be all over, but it's been such a thrill to be here at, in Nelson and, and to be part of the Elephant Mountain Literary Festival, especially after COVID, and to be with these astonishing writers. Um, 
And um, it was also a real thrill to be the writer in residence this year. So um, some of the writers that I had a chance to mentor were in the are in the audience. I, and um, yeah, it was just, it was truly delightful to do a mind morph with you in that little room in the back of the United Church and uh, to feel the, um, the energy of those books. And um, I know that there's going to be some really fascinating, fascinating new published books in the near future. So that was fun. And thank you. And what a lot of talent. Um, so I'm reading from my book, Petra. It's a fictional account of Petra Kelly, who was a woman who was so dynamic in her time. I had the incredible opportunity of meeting her in Vancouver in 1986. Um, and like so many wonderful, dynamic, charismatic women, she's been mostly erased from history. Um, she was the founder of the German Green Party, one of the co-founders, with this little cabal of other people. And um, she was also the main leader in the fight against nuclear missiles to be stationed in Germany in, um, in the early 80s, in, in, the, in the 1980s, um, 1980 to 83. And um, she was just this bundle of opposites. She was charismatic, and she was anxious, and she was narcissistic, and she was sexy, and she was larger than life, and she was smaller than life. You know, she was just an absolutely fascinating bundle of contradictions, and I think that's why I got so interested in writing about her. Um, she fell in love in, in real life. This is, you know, none of it fiction yet. She fell in love with a German general, and that's the bit I'm going to read tonight. Um, the press made a lot out of it. They called them the peace, the peace maiden and the general. And um, uh, I'm going to start about uh, page 20 and read for, you know, about 15 minutes. Um, and what, what's happened so far is that uh, she's heard about him. He's done something a little bit special. There was a... Um, a big banquet, and he was with all these other NATO generals, and they started to play uh, Hitler's March, which they would do, and um, the march that Hitler loved the most that they would play when, when, um, when Hitler entered the room, the Badenweiler March, and he got up, and he walked across the room, and he tapped the conductor on the shoulder, and he said, would you mind not playing that song? So Petra's heard about this, and um, she sends him a postcard, and now, um, so she's gotten wind of him. And um, this is the section where, where he gets wind of her. Is the sound okay? Okay. Much later, perhaps two years after that day in Bonn, Emile Gerhardt told me, oh, by the way, the me is a, a, a fellow who's narrating, Manfred Schwartz, who's also in love with Petra. Everyone's in love with Petra in this book. Yeah. Um, Emile Gerhardt told me that the first time he heard Petra's voice was on the car radio as she delivered that speech. He was in his Peugeot with his wife, Helena, driving from Munich, where they had spent the day shopping and lunching with friends. They were on the Autobahn, returning to the little village near Würzburg, where they lived and where the 12th Panzer Division was based. Helena was asleep, her head resting on the passenger window. Rolling hills flashed by. It began to rain, spattering drops that hit the windshield and then began to leap up from the road itself as though the rain was being driven upwards out of the asphalt. Even with the wipers beating at full speed, it became difficult to see, and Emile pulled into a rest stop. A man rushed past, a newspaper covering his head, and then there was nothing but the steady drumming on the car roof. Emile was a handsome man, with wavy salt and pepper hair and a toned upper body from his general's regimens of morning push-ups. He was an interesting mix of strong-willed and yet distant, Ironic almost in his attitudes towards the world, as though he moved through it, but didn't quite but it didn't quite touch him. He smiled now, remembering. There was Petra in full force on the radio. Oh yes, she was in full harangue, going after NATO and all the short sighted generals. Her voice. A single Pershing missile contains enough firepower to wipe out life on Earth several times over. But will we stop loving my friends? They can knock down our bodies, but they cannot knock down our hearts. He reached out to change the channel. His fingers hovered above the dial, but something stopped him. Her whole self seemed to lean into the words. Little animals, she said, SS-20s, the sound of destruction. She began, then she began dropping BB pedal, pellets into a tin can in front of the microphone. Each little metal, metal pellet represented the firepower of the dr bomb dropped on Hiroshima. 
the cumulative sound becoming the firepower of the Pershing II and cruise missiles slated for West Germany, the rain on the car roof mixed with the dinging pellets, and then the relentless ping, 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 ping grew heavier than the downpour, a rain of darkness and destruction, filling every inch of the car with static. It seemed to go on forever. Emile's heart had begun to hammer. The car was too small, too close. The sound was making him sick. He was about to thrust the door open when he realized the sound was lessening. By increments, the pellets could be heard individually again. And then, at last, with a final patter, they stopped. That's the sound of death, my friends. It's the sound of pain. It's the sound of fear. It's the sound of ground zero. But let me make this clear. It is also the sound of zero imagination because the men who brought up, who thought up their mega death failed to imagine us standing in this place willing to lay our bodies on the line. Helena lifted her head. Who on earth is that? No one. Emil turned the radio off. It didn't sound like no one. He started the car and took the ramp up onto the Autobahn, picking up speed. That was that green girl, Helena said, the one who's always talking. It was dusk as they approached their house on its quaint street backing onto the river. They ate scrambled eggs and toast, watched the news, and went to bed early. Emil rolled over and held Helena and kissed her gently near the ear, which made a soft popping sound in her head. I forgot to tell you, he, she said. There's a postcard for you downstairs. It's from that girl. Who? The one on the radio. As well as commanding the division at Würzburg, Emil had an office at the Sentag headquarters at Heidelberg, and for the next several weeks he kept to his routine, driving to Heidelberg midweek, putting together a memo on procurement, finishing several other large files. Then one morning, he took a clean sheet of paper from the drawer and inserted it into the typewriter. This memorandum was one he did not intend to dictate to his secretary. Two. Herr Hans Appel, Minister of Defense, Fe Defense, Federal Republic of Germany, from Major General Emil Gerhardt, Divisional Commander, 12th Panzer Division, regarding impending deployment of intermediate range nuclear missiles. He sat with his fingers on the key while the principal points of the letter formed in his mind. Regret, only reasonable choice, stand behind other NATO decisions and NATO and the Bundeswehr as crucial institutions for the liberty and protection of mankind. Humankind? Yes, yes, humankind. All this goes without saying, without need for reiteration. No, no, without saying. The impending deployment of highly flexible intermediate range missiles runs counter to national and global security. Yes, good words. In point of fact, while these missiles are intended to improve east-west stability, their first strike capability and hair trigger responsiveness could have a catastrophic result to which I, in good conscience, can no longer be a party. He was using military language, coating his words with a varnish. But could he seriously be taking this step? He started to sweat heard the radio voice again, a feverish sharpness near his right temple. Even the animals are outraged, and the ancient spirits of this earth. And then that postcard out of nowhere, lofted to him by gods who wanted to drive things home, fate speaking in a few scrawled words. He'd flipped the postcard to see the Rhine covered in sparkles, and remembered his mother telling him of Lorelei, white dress, stars in her hair, a voice no man could resist. Ridiculous, of course, to let his mother into his head now of all moments. She had no place in what was happening to him, with her blonde hair and stone blue eyes, her huge, as it had seemed to him as a child, forehead, and her strong fingers, which she manicured and cleaned after working all day in other people's gardens, rich people's gardens. How she had detested being of service to the rich when she herself, as she had told him again and again and again, had once been rich of a good family, was what she said, sniffing loudly. With a shake of his head, he banished her, then shrugged to release the tension of his shoulders. in his shoulders. He was a miracle of tension, a cluster of clenched muscles. What 
was he doing? Every now and then a secretary clipped by in the corridor wearing what he knew were attractive shoes. Then one clacked along in leather boots, less attractive. Then he heard the shush and creak of the mail cart, the squeaking wheel of the coffee trolley. He had meant to bring oil for it. He had told the coffee girl he would, and she'd laughed and said, I'm sure you have more important duties, General. He'd liked that. Nothing beneath him, but he'd forgotten. He ought to be thinking about the missiles, the balance of east and west, the complex game the two sides played, like chess but with volatile pieces, each of which could blow up the world. He wanted his letter to reflect this truth. The military balance isn't balanced. We're on a precipice. I must, in full conscience, speak. But what was making him sweat, really sweat down his sides, was the question of money. If he took this step, how would he live? He was only, he had, was only eight years away from retirement, and if he resigned now, he'd have to settle for three quarters of the pension he was due. He had Helena to think of. She liked to live well. It was part of her essence, her aristocratic Dresden background, which, though stripped away by the war, managed to reassert itself in an appreciation of porcelain, silk slips, and fine woolens. woolens. The other day in Würzburg, as they passed a shop window displaying cashmere sweaters, Helena had made a small, pigeon-like murmur of desire in her throat. The sweaters were arranged in stacks, from moody violet to throbbing crimson, passing through all the colors of the spectrum, moss green, gold, wheat, almond. Emil learned the names later when he returned to the store, the clerk holding up each one for him to feel the weight. A wearable sweater, the woman kept saying, as though she had stacks of unwearable ones in the back. In the end, Emil bought a sweater in charcoal, not quite black, not quite brown. It had a V-neck and would look pretty with Helena's knee-length leather skirt and gold jewelry. Yes, he even knew how his wife would accessorize her new sweater. To resign would mean the end of buying cashmere on impulse. And though Helena might, with or without sweaters, applaud him for his courage, she might also, and this was far more likely, tell him he was being high-handed. She might even guess, this he would not admit to his soul, that her, his resignation was in part personally strategic as his involvement with Julia Kunst, junior secretary, blonde, plush white ass, had become complicated. He wasn't sure what Helena knew about Julia. He and his wife could go long periods without discussing important issues in their marriage. In fact, non-discussion seemed to aid their particular form of coexistence. Emil pushed back his chair and stood. He went to the window and looked down at the parking lot with its line of American trucks covered in canvas camouflage. Directly below in the civilian lot, a few bare ash trays, trees stood root-locked in concrete planters. A woman in a red beret exited the building. At first, she appeared as nothing more than the red dot of her hat, but as she crossed the lot, he caught a glimpse of slender legs clad in black tights. Her back was to him, but she seemed pretty. He detected a ponytail. If she looks back, he thought, I will take this next step. She strode across the lot. Emil leaned closer, misting the glass. Look back, he willed her. Look back, look back. The ash trees were splayed below him, mealy and desperate, but one tree stood by itself in the square in front of the original barracks, a beech tree. How different it was, standing by itself like a king, naked and powerful, limbs lifted to the sky, older than the parking lot, older than Sentag. When he glanced up from it, only a second had passed, but the girl was gone. Abruptly, he crossed to his desk, pulled the sheet of paper from the typewriter, turned it over, and taking the fountain pen from his breast pocket, he wrote two words, inere Führung, inner leadership. The word stared back at him. The I and the F looked alarming, as though his handwriting was someone else's. He had heard of that, handwriting changing in a crisis, becoming heavier, more slanted. He stared down at the penned words for a full second, perhaps two. Then his mood dissolved. He shook his head, glanced to the closed door, embarrassed by this grandiose flourish, which a moment before had seemed like a spasm of necessary action. Now it seems showy, absurd. In era Furhang, inner leadership, the concept so crucial to the West German military, had many layers, 
but it boiled down to the idea that those who put on the uniform of the Bundeswehr must never again shed their individual morality, never again say, I was just following orders. The idea had spawned its own central office and thousands of pages of briefing notes and handbooks, and most recently, a lecture series by a bald-headed psychologist from Koblenz. This inner Führung education was dictated from above, ironically, causing some senior officers to grumble. It seemed to them a barren substitute for the grandeur of German military tradition. Not that they were vocally nostalgic for the Nazi years, far from it. It was the symbols of the office corps that they missed, the code of honor, the autumn maneuvers, the pageantry of the oath, the procession of banners and the torchlit tattoo. All of this had been erased, and in its place was a code that often felt quite clinical and abstract. Some, of, some had even dubbed it inner strangulation. Emile could see their point. Why serve an army if it had no history, no sense of grandeur or manliness? It was unappealing. Yet he could hear the words of the lecturer from Koblenz, pointer in hand, egg-like head lit from above. We must develop our innate sense of inner guidance. Never again can we take orders without taking personal responsibility for them. We must know our actions to be just. Ah, it hurt. It actually hurt. That was what the Koblenz psychologist never mentioned, what not one of the thousands of pages of briefing notes detailed, what you must find out for yourself. It hurt in the chest, a hand squeezing his heart. Perhaps he would have a heart attack. Now that was an idea. He smiled wryly at the thought, a heart attack from following his conscience. Watch out, he told himself. Trying to be a better man just might kill you. Thank you. So next up, uh, we have our very own Suzanne Simard. One of the world's leading forest ecologists, Suzanne has reached millions through the TED Talk, through, sorry, through three TED Talks, the documentary Fantastic Fungi, and especially her groundbreaking 2021 memoir, Finding the Mother Tree. Excuse me, sorry, Suzanne. Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, which explains how forest ecologies and fungal mycelium are interdependent and why it matters. She also shows us how storytelling, the way that science is communicated, and that's the first time I think I've ever heard science and storytelling come together, and I thought it was brilliant. How this has the power to spark interest, imagination, and action. Tonight, this fascinating author presents her work in her very own hometown, and we are so pleased to have her here. Suzanne. Hello. So it's an honor to be here with these incredible authors and readers and storytellers. My gosh. Um, in some ways, I don't belong here, but. Uh, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle, I, I mean, I, I admire your work, all the act, you know, how much. In saving Jumbo, basically being instrumental in that. I mean, I, I hope you have a long life of, of doing amazing things ahead of you. Yeah. So um, thank you for that introduction, but I'm going to introduce myself by reading the opening chapter to my book um, called Connections. And it really tells who I am at the core. Um, it tells my story, and it's a lead into why I did the work that I did and wrote the book that I, I did. Um, I hope, you know, I, I kind of, I know that we're in this special moment in time right now. We know that um, there's a lot of social issues that could kill us. There's a lot of environmental issues that could kill us at this point. Um, but I wanted to write a book of hope, um, that there are solutions, and so anyway, I. I hope that um, I hope that I convince you when you read the book that there is so much that we can do and and so many successes that we can build on. So here we go. 
um, connections. For generations, my family has made its living cutting down for us. Our survival has depended on this humble trade. It is my legacy, and I have cut, cut down my fair share of trees as well. But nothing lives on our planet without death and decay. From this springs new life, and from this birth will come new death. This spiral of living taught me to become a sower of seeds too, a planter of seedlings, a keeper of saplings, a part of the cycle. The forest itself is part of much larger cycles, the building of soil and migration of species and circulation of oceans, the source of clean air and pure water and good food. There is a, there is a necessary wisdom in the give and take of nature, its quiet agreements and search for balance. There is extraordinary generosity. Working to solve the mysteries of what made the forest tick and how they linked to the earth and fire and water made me a scientist. I watched the forest and I listened. I followed where my curiosity led me. I listened to the stories of my people, the family, and I learned from the scholars. Step by step, puzzle by puzzle, I poured everything I had into becoming a sleuth of what it takes to heal the natural world. And I was lucky to become one of the first in the new generation of women in the logging industry. But what I found was not what I had grown up to understand. Instead, I discovered vast landscapes cleared of trees, soils stripped of nature's complexity, a persistent harshness of elements, communities devoid of old trees, leaving the young ones vulnerable, and an, and an industrial order that felt hugely, terribly misguided. The industry had declared war on those parts of the ecosystem, the leafy plants and the broadleaf trees, the nibblers, the gleaners and infestors. They were seen as competitors and parasites on cash crops, but what I was discovering were necessary for healing the earth. The whole forest, central to my being and sense of the universe, was suffering from this disruption, and because of that, all else suffered too. So I set out on scientific expeditions to figure out where we had gone so very wrong and to unlock the mysteries of why the land mended itself when left to its own devices, as I'd seen happen when my ancestors logged with a lighter touch. Along the way, it became uncanny, almost eerie, the way my work unfolded in lockstep with my personal life, entwined as intimately as the parts of the ecosystem I was studying. The trees soon revealed startling secrets. I discovered, I discovered that they are a web of interdependence, linked by a system of underground channels where they perceive and connect and relate with an ancient intricacy and wisdom that can no longer be denied. I conducted hundreds of experiments with one discovery leading to the next, and through this quest, I uncovered the lessons of tree-to-tree -tree communication of the relationships that create a forest society. The evidence was, as, was at first highly controversial, but the science is now known to be rigorous, peer-reviewed, and widely published. It is no fairy tale, no flight of fancy, no magical unicorn, and no fiction in a Hollywood movie. And so I wrote this book because I wanted to reach people at this really crucial moment. Um, as we gain better understanding of where we're at at this moment in history and what we can do about it. And I wanted to, you know, convey some important messages. And here's just a few of them. But one of the first things is, you know, in this life that we're in right now, um, so many of us feel disconnected from the forest, from the natural world, from the word, the, the world that, the word for world that is forest that Ursula Le Guin talked about. We are the forest. We are one with the forest. That's the one, number one thing I wanted to remind people in writing this book. And the second thing is in learning from the trees that we're all connected together, right? We all um, inter are interdependent. We depend on each other as the trees are in nature. And then the third, um, which is so poignant right now, um, that matriarchs, that the mothers of society are so important. And in forests, they are the key, the hubs, the things that link everything together. And it's ironic, you know, that this book was a number one bestseller on the New York Times for a couple weeks in the U.S. And today, yesterday, declaring that abortion is illegal in the overturning of Roe versus Wade. What an upside-down world we live in. It's an attack on women. 
It is. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then, you know, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, but, you know, the, the, in the storytelling, in the conveying of how we feel about these things, about how we feel about the state of the world, about how we feel about social and environmental justice, um, that science plays a role in that and is really just another story, a story like the stories told today about us making sense of our world and what to do about it. Um, and so one of the things that we've learned and I convey in the book is that we've got to learn not just that we are, can, we are the forest, that we are all connected, um, but that we go back to our roots and, and re-understand that we are here to care for this place, not to, not to take from this place, but to be care, caretakers, to be responsible stewards of the forest. And I think the last thing I wanted to convey in this book is that um, above all, to never give up hope that the world and the forest is wired to heal. The world and the forest is wired to recover and regenerate and that we have huge agency in our future to make sure that that happens. So um, I'm going to read a little bit further <laughs> and talk about mother trees. Um, so, and then I'm going to tell a little story. So let me get back to the book. Um, okay. In the search for truth, truth, trees have shown me their perceptiveness and responsiveness, connections and conversations. And what started as a legacy and then a place of childhood home, because it's really started from when I was a child, an adventure in Western Canada had grown into a fuller understanding of the intelligence of the forest. And further, an exploration of how we can regain our respect for this wisdom and heal our relationship with nature. One of the first clues came when I was tapping into the messages that the trees were relaying back and forth through a cryptic underground fungal network. When I followed the clandestine path of the conversations, I learned that this network is pervasive through the entire forest, connecting all trees in a constellation of tree hubs and fungal links. A crude map revealed stunningly that the biggest, oldest timbers are the sources of fungal connections to regenerating seedlings. Not only that, they connect to all neighbors, young and old, serving as the linchpins for a jungle of threads and synapses and nodes. I'll take you through this journey that revealed the most shocking aspect of this pattern, that it has similarities with our own human brains. In it, the old and the young are perceiving and communicating, responding to one another by emitting chemical signals, chemicals identical to our own neurotransmitters, signals created by ions cascading across fungal membranes. The older trees are able to discern which seedlings are their own kin. The older trees nurture the young ones and provide them with food and water, just as we do with our own children. It is enough to make one pause, take a deep breath, and contemplate the social nature of the forest and how this is critical for evolution. The fungal network appears to wire the trees for fitness. And more, these old trees are mothering their children they're mother trees. The mother trees, the majestic hubs at the center of the forest of communication, protection, and sentience, they die, they pass their wisdom to their kin, generation after generation, sharing the knowledge of what helps and what harms, who is friend, who is foe, how to adapt and survive in an ever-changing <coughs> landscape. It's what all parents do. So let me <laughs> remind you, this is no fairy tale. It's no flight of fancy. It is no magical unicorn. This is science. So um, I'm just going to read a little bit on my own discovery of mothers when I was much, much younger. Of course, I had a mother. <laughs> um, but I, I rediscovered as I was a young, you know, as I becoming a young scientist in my own um, stumbling, humble way. And it was um, when I was on a hike one day. So I'm just going to read you this little story. How is that? I've got a much deeper voice when I talk like this. <laughs> okay. So this is a little story about my, my best friend and I, Jean. And we're hiking 
in the Stein River Valley. And the Stein is um, it's near Lytton, which you might remember from the news, Lytton burnt down last, last summer. Um, but Lytton is the doorstep to the Stein River Valley, which is a, is a, um, a deeply culturally important valley to the Nakmamux people. And at the time I went hiking there, I didn't know that, um, but I sure found out in a hurry. Um, so let me tell you this story. The next morning, Jean organized our breakfast while I went to an, an emerald pool to wash. We were, we were hiking up into a, into a hanging glacier because I was celebrating my 22nd birthday. I scanned the trees for signs of grizzly, but all was quiet. A collection of maidenhair ferns with their delicate black stems grew from a patch of humus at the base of a rock wall covered in a cascade of licorice ferns. I splashed my face. Lady ferns grew in the recesses of humus, and tiny oak ferns covered the rises in the shadow of the trees. Each had, like Darwin, Darwin's finches, found a niche. Overwhelmed by a strong, rotting smell, I glanced around. The trees and shrubs were motionless. The ferns, all five species, were serene. It occurred to me that the odor was cash, rotting meat that a grizzly had dragged in overnight. I hurried to the cabin and I shouted, Jean, let's get out of here. We hastily slung on our packs as the pale sun was rising over the skyline peaks. On the trail beside the pool, we encountered the leg bone of a, of a deer. We raced down the trail, singing at the top of our lungs. Within minutes, we were hiking past the lodge poles, nerve-wracking because the skinny trunks lacked branches, and even if we could somehow shinny up, the crinkly bark would cut our legs. Possible hiding spaces jumped out at me. Every curve in the path, every creek that might be crossed, every low-lying branch presented a potential escape route. After an eternity eternity along the pine stretch, the trail descended back through the expanses of taller Douglas firs. With their big branches and soft grassy understory, the firs felt friendly and secure. Dry Douglas fir forests are not favorite habitat for grizzlies. They prefer the high elevation forests and alpine meadows in August because they're cooler and the berries are ripening. I relaxed and broke into an even lope with Jean. Down, 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 feeling the weight of our packs, the duct tape I used to jerry-rig the right shoulder strap was fraying, so I fiddled with it, barely noticing the grasses and flowers waving at me. All of a sudden, Jean cried, Grizzly! A few meters away were a mother and two cubs, staring straight at us. I reached for the air horn, horn but it had fallen off somewhere else. <laughs> the bears were as stunned as we were, they were so close we could smell the carrion on their breath. We slowly backed up to the nearest trees. Jean dropped her pack and started climbing a Douglas fir, set, finding footholds in its gnarly branches. I grasped the scaly trunk of a neighboring tree while the mama bear squealed at her cubs. Using my head as a battering ram, I plowed through the thicket of branches. Jean was scrambling a good five meters higher than I was managing and I was anxious to match her pace. The grizzlies could easily tear me down while I was so low. Blood poured from gashes and scrapes on my face and arms. My tree shook with fear. Jean's tree was letting her race up its massive trunk, speeding into the canopy. In my haste, I'd neglected to drop my pack and I had picked a much smaller tree. When I reached as high as I could go, it was swaying back and forth, back and forth. And I was afraid I would drop onto Mama and her cubs, now wandering directly below my tree. After glaring at me, she sent her cubs up two ponderosa pines, safely out of the way while she dealt with us. The orange trunks had no branches, but the cubs were light and their claws were sharp. Mama snorted instructions <laughs> as they scrambled and came to rest in crowns soaring well above where we clung. Mama turned around and looked at us and reared up on her hind legs for a better look. Grizzlies are known for their poor eyesight. When she decided we were indisposed, 
she wore a path back and forth between the four trees. Perched high while she was calling the shots, I thanked my lucky stars. With my toes locked into a whorl, my hands bleeding, I leaned into my tree to rest. The warmth of the bark and sweet smell of the needles momentarily calmed me. Jean caught my eye and nodded toward the cubs. Their black eyes framed in blonde crew cuts were peering at us. Jean couldn't help but grin at them. Hours crept by. I shifted my feet to ease the pain in my back, and I resettled my pack, worried we'd be clinging here all night. Luckily, I was too dehydrated from the hike to need to pee. The cubs, I swore, fell asleep, while Mama sternly kept us all in detention. I wished I could sleep too, but I couldn't stop trembling. My mind drifted to my mom, because vanilla scent wafting from the ponderosa bark reminded me of her kitchen, and I was desperate to ask her how to get out of this pickle. Jean's resplendent tree wasn't shaking like mine. Either Jean was more courageous than I was, of which I had little doubt, or the tree was stouter, a true elder. Leading, commanding, dignified, its crown deeper and more imposing than those of its neighbors, providing shade for the younger trees below. Shedding seed evolved over centuries, stretching its prodigious limbs where songbirds roosted and nested, where wolf lichens and mistletoes found crevices in which to root, letting, no needing, squirrels to run up and down its trunk in search of cones to store in middens for later meals, and to hang mushrooms in the cro crooks of the branches to dry and eat. This tree alone was a scaffold for, for biodiversity, fueling the, cy the cycles of the forest. My arms wrapped more tightly around the trunk. Mama settled under the ponderosas as her cubs slept. It got darker. My tremble reduced to a quiver, my terror to mere fright. In the safety of my tree, I, found, I felt myself slowly grafting to its bark and melting into its heartwood, astonished at how calm I'd become in its branches. A woodpecker hammered at an ailing tree nearby, sending bark flying as it carved a new hole for its family. Next door, a snag hosted a larger cavity. It looked like a woodpecker hole too, but bigger and rougher because that tree had started to rot and the hole's edges had frayed. Woodpeckers and it wouldn't be safe from predators. Something moved inside. The white face and yellow owl eyes of an owl peeked out. <coughs> it turned its head and let out a hoot, maybe to the woodpecker, maybe curious about the commotion. The woodpecker and the owl seemed to know each other. Neighbors sharing nests and warning signals, the old trees bearing witness. The smoldering glow of the, of the sinking sun washed over the trees. My thoughts drifted towards the remnants of the, bake, of the birthday cake in Jean's pack. Mama had wandered over from the ponderosas and was nosing around. She snorted a command. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Her cubs scurried down, and they bounded through the bush with their mother, leaves chattering in their wake. Then, silence. The branches sagged under my weight, and I imagined they were wishing I'd get off them. Think they're gone? I called out to Jean as quietly as I could. I don't know, but I'm hungry. Time to go. She started down. I shouted my worry, but Jean, sensibly enough, pointed out that we couldn't stay in these trees forever. I shinnied down, reaching the base right after Jean's boots hit the ground. She looked at my scraped raw arms, but was even more impressed that her cuts were deeper. We're lucky they didn't smell our blood, she said, inspecting her pack. No teeth marks. She unzipped the one, one of the side pockets big as an elephant's ear, a source of pride because they doubled the size of her pack, and we downed the leftover cake. Guess they don't like chocolate, Jean insisted. Jean insisted she heard rocks falling up in the valley, and that meant we were safe. Her tree was stolid and serene as, we, as it watched us leave. I glanced at mine. Its leader nestled under the, under the crown of Jean's. I wondered if Jean's tree was the parent of mine, since most seeds fall close by, almost all dropping to the ground within a few hundred meters. A few heavy seeds are carried further afield across creeks and hollows by squirrels, chipmunks, and birds. The odd one catches in an updraft and flies across the valley on a wing. 
but most seeds drop in the outskirts of a mother's tree's crown. Jean's old tree was likely the parent of mine. It seemed protective of it all, of it all, of all of us. I tipped my hat in thanks and whispered that I would be back to learn more from her. And we ran, banging our pots and pans, shouting at the grizzlies that we were leaving. <laughs> Thank you to all of our authors for all of your incredible work, for having such dedication, such passion for the craft of words and how to put them together. It was a real treat for all of us tonight to hear all of you read from your works and, uh, and to do it in person at that. We never thought two years ago that we would uh, be so grateful just to be here together. Uh, so, as you know, there are many people who come together to put on a festival like this, and so I would like to thank the City of Nelson, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, the RDCK, Columbia Basin Trust, it's a list, Simon Fraser University, notably Nelson Kootenai Lake Tourism, for their sponsors, and if you are missed one of them, there's the poster right there. Thank you, Robin. And um, thank you also to the Nelson Star for always being uh, so supportive of the festival and also for our arts community. Uh, they do a really great job of making sure our arts community is talked about in our broader community. And we've had some very wonderful venues as well, the Prestige right here. Of course, our amazing library, the Nelson Public Library and the Nelson United Church. And just a few words of note, uh, Don Pemberton's lyric writing workshop and concert have been postponed to the fall, uh, so if you had signed up for that, uh, make sure your calendar is open in the fall. Uh, and tomorrow at 10 a.m., a no-host brunch right here on the deck of the Prestige. So if uh, you're looking forward to seeing the people who have been attending the festival the last few days and, and you're worried that you're going to miss them and well, you got a chance tomorrow over some uh, Eggs Benny. And please consider joining the Kootenai Literary Society. For a whopping dollar, you can connect with other local writers, be part of a community, and really hone your skills and talents. Uh, I've been uh, studying creative writing the last year, uh, doing a certificate in creative writing, and the best part of it I've learned so much, but mostly it's through the other writers. It's the people in my class, uh, them taking a look at my work and saying, mm, I think it might have been better if you had just used this word differently. And those little bits of wisdom have transformed my skills and my abilities, and it has been awesome. So for $1, $1. You can join the Kootenai Literary Society and get that camaraderie as well. And, of course, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so that the Kootenai Literary Society can let you know about events happening throughout the year and about the 2023... Uh, I just can't get over it. It's, we're already talking about 2023, right? 2023 Youth Outreach Program in the schools. And you can do both at the emlfestival.com. And other than the brunch tomorrow, this is the festival's final event. So I hope everybody had a wonderful time.